Welcome to part three of my Why I'm Not a Feminist video response to a letter Lauren Southern received where I will be going through it bit by bit addressing the flaws and claims made within the letter. And now the continuation. Almost half the domestic abuse victims in the U.S. and Canada are men. Given that you don't cite your source here, Lauren, I do not know where you found this statistic. However, depending on where you look, you may find dramatically different numbers. Some will show what you describe, a relative gender symmetry, while others show that it is largely women experiencing intimate partner violence. Well, let me help you with those sources. So why are there such different numbers? Actually, Michael Johnson has a pretty good article and will respond directly to most of your claims. It's called Gender and Types of Intimate Partner Violence, a response to an anti-feminist literature review. But I will try and lay some of it out here. Since other people have done the work for me, I'll quote Kelly and Johnson on the topic. Let me guess, they're going to redefine violence to better fit the women get it worst narrative. For over two decades, considerable controversy has centered on whether it is men who are primarily violent in intimate partner relationships or whether it is gender symmetry in perpetuating violence. Proponents of both viewpoints cite multiple empirical studies to support their views. These two viewpoints can be reconciled largely by an examination of the samples and measures used to collect the contradictory data, and the recognition that the different types of intimate partner violence exist in our society and are represented in these samples. Based on hundreds of studies, it is quite apparent that both men and women are violent in intimate partner relationships. There is gender symmetry in some types of intimate partner violence. At least you recognize that both men and women can be quite violent in relationships. You get one point for this. So then we break down the data. What you will find is there are a few important but different types of IPV. Ah, so this is where you start redefining violence and perpetuate the women get it worse narrative. Coercive controlling violence. This is what most people think of when they envision domestic violence. This type of IPV is routine and used to control the partner through multiple forms of coercion. This type of violence is more likely to result in serious physical injury or death. While men can be victims of this type of violence on the whole, it is overwhelmingly perpetuated by heterosexual men against their female partners. This type of domestic violence is rooted in patriarchy and misogyny. Oh, you said patriarchy. So according to this, Bigfoot is real. On that note, overwhelmingly perpetuated by men, huh? As Johnson and Kelly described, data obtained from women's shelters, court-mandated treatment programs, police reports, and emergency rooms are more likely to report this type of violence. Which is interesting because Aaron Pizzi, who founded the first women's shelter in England and studied domestic violence for over 40 years, had this to say. No, but it's not like that. It's not a gender issue. It has nothing to do with patriarchy. That's a whole made-up nonsense. It's actually fraud. Violent resistance. This type of IPV accounts for the fact that some people respond to coercive controlling violence with violent resistance. The vast majority of violent resistance is done by women against male coercive controlling partners. But charges are sometimes filed in these cases and they contribute to the patterns in the statistics. Unlike the coercive controlling partner, violent resistance is reactive and the intention is not to control. So this is mostly calculated by testimony of the victim. I'm not saying there cannot be cases like this, but if you believe one testimony, you have to believe in male testimony too. Can a man not be violently resistant? How do you know outside of testimony? Sounds like the, well, he started it argument. Situational couple violence. This is by far the most common type of IPV and is perpetuated by both men and women close to gender symmetry. This generally results from the escalation of an argument between partners, but is not representative of chronic violence, intimidation, or stalking. Although it is serious and can be lethal, on the whole it tends to involve more minor forms of violence and is less likely to result in serious injury. Fear of the partner is also not a characteristic of men or women in this form of IPV. I don't think feminists realize the societal attitudes when it comes to male victimization. Remember, these are the claims. There are no safe houses for them, no court advocacy programs, no subsidized counseling or legal care like women. You see, our help programs are about concerns of being violent and not about being the victim. Lauren's claims still stand. Large-scale survey research using community and national samples account more for this type of violence and therefore report greater gender symmetry in the initiation and participation of men and women in partner violence. So yes, Lauren, you're right that men are victims of intimate partner violence too. Both men and women commit violence in both heterosexual and same-sex relationships. All of this violence does matter. Here comes the but. But when you're talking about systemic violence, violence rooted in fear and control, the violence that results in serious injury, the vast majority of assailants are men and the vast majority of victims are women. Wrong. Sorry, why is fear the deciding factor of severity when it comes to the violence received by a partner? Why is it worse than, say, weaponized violence? Just because I'm not afraid doesn't mean that there isn't a danger. Your vast majority statement is just wrong. At least a third of all female homicide victims in the U.S. are killed by male intimate partners, compared to 2.5% for men. Ignoring the fact that there's a huge portion of homicides that are classified as unknown for both men and women, this is absolutely true. You fail to realize, though, that 2.5% of 18,000 deaths is still 450 deaths caused by a partner, while one-third of women deaths, 1,000 of those are caused by a partner. 
So men die half as much as women, but how many domestic violence shelters do men have compared to women? Definitely not half as many. On the whole, gender symmetry in IPV tends to be clustered at the lower levels of violence. As the statistics you quote do not distinguish based on severity, frequency, whether an attack was in self-defense, or if it was in part of a pattern of fear and coercive behavior. All of this would have to be proven, because again, Aaron Pizzi would disagree with you along with 200 plus other studies showing it's pretty dang even. Also add to this that men are more likely to call the police on their partner, more likely to press charges, and less likely to drop charges. What would a cop do when a woman is abusing a man? Self-centered! Ah. Hi guys. Why not call 911? Uh, what they would have, they would just have a little tiff. It'd be alright. This does not mean that feminists don't care when violence happens to men, or that they don't want to see men protected from this violence, because they do. However, given the realities taking place when you examine the numbers closely, it's not surprising that most feminist energy addressing IPV is focusing on women facing coercive, controlling violence. Plus, consider the ways that IPV is still shaped by systemic, largely enshrined patriarchy in this country. Oh, you said patriarchy. So according to this, Bigfoot is real. Until recently, men had the legal right to beat their wives. In the book Domestic Assault of Women, it talks about how anyone that beat their wife would be subject to a flogging of their own. So I don't know how recent you are talking here, because ever since 1904, it was against the law. But you're right, the past was horrible. Is it that way today? In fact, as recently as the 1980s, police would delay responding to domestic violence calls and often wives had no legal recourse to demand protection from the state. Yet you fail to realize that technically men had no legal recourse either. And in many cases still don't, due to societal attitudes. This logic about male dominance over women is not wiped from our history yet, Lauren, and it continues to shape the treatment of our women by partners and by the state, which is supposed to protect them. It is also very important to add that your claim that men do not have access to victim services is also incorrect. The Violence Against Women Act, which feminists championed in 1994, legally protects both men and women who are victims of domestic violence. And the VAWA does offer male victims all the same services and protections that are available to women. Maybe this argument sounds familiar as it's used by many feminists. What is written in law is different than in practice. Feminists had no choice in the wording to include men. The 14th Amendment chose for them. While there are many feminists who work on the issue of intimate partner violence, if you want to check out some more, I particularly recommend the work of Rachel Payne and Donna Cuomo. I will also refer you to a book called Prone to Violence by Aaron Pizzi and Jeff Chaprio. Like, subscribe, comment. Till next time.